Man, this is the best time to be hosting a podcast, man. So my favorite time of the year is always DCAC Live Week. It's just a whole different energy that gets pumped into the industry, I feel, right? But, and um, we're here in Austin, Texas, and I'm joined by, please introduce yourself to those that don't know who you are. Yeah, I'm, I'm David Mitchell, founder and CEO at XYZ. XYZ, man. So what a cool name. What we were talking about off camera was I randomly met you for the first time. We were in con. I was wrapping up a breakfast meeting and I was jumping into an Uber and I yep. think you were just hopping out of one, going to the same place where I was just at, right? Yep. But it's a small world. This industry brings us by each other. We were always in orbit with each other, but now we get a chance to finally sit down. So let's begin with this. Tell people about XYZ. What are, that, what are they? Who are they? Where are they based from? Where do they do? Yeah, so uh, ultimately the vision for XYZ is builders building from holograms. Nice. Um, so we've hold built, on. So building from holograms. Yeah. So using emerging technology as a vehicle for building, or so we built our own uh, AR headset. Okay. Uh, custom built for construction. Nice. All the health and safety demands and everything. Is this for like else. clash coordination studies? Is this for the trades? What was this for? Uh, so so. First of all, we built the headset. Um, the objective is literally builders build it from holograms. So one of our founding studies, like back in the day, I suppose if I go way back, and my background's in construction. We'll start with your background, actually. Yeah. So wh where are you from? What's the accent? Is it London? Uh, is it West of Ireland. West of Ireland, yeah. okay. Yeah, and uh, grew up there. My father was a builder. Okay. Uh, so I grew up on construction sites, learned to walk in a building site. I always say my first tool was a shovel. Nice. And uh, really worked my way up through the ranks from there. So went into commercial construction management, uh, you know, worked on small residential towers, hotels and the like. Um, I then became a civil engineer, followed by an architect for all my sins. No kidding. Yeah. I uh, came out the other side of that, practice in Paris. Uh, turtlenecks didn't quite suit the man from the west of Ireland. Okay. Um, so I went back to major construction in London. Okay. Uh, got to work on Shard, Battersea Power Station, many more projects there, iconic projects. And then my last stage of my career before founding, founding XYZ was uh, building data centers around Europe. Which one, I mean, wholesale operators, was it more like enterprise end users? What were we talking about? So I was on the subcontracting side. Okay. Uh, helping out with a firm called J Coffee Construction. Okay. Shout out to them. And uh, yeah, from there, I, I, I really, you know, I always had this notion of, surely we can do better within the industry. You sure. Know? Um, and we can. And I we hope can. there's more views in the industry right now that have a chip on their shoulder like we could do this. Yeah, better. exactly. And I, I call out to them like, no kidding. go for it. You, you know? have to be driving this industry. Right. 100%. So like XYZ was kind of born out of that experience. And back in 2014, 2015, um, I was pulled onto this data center project and I'd been working on this notion of paperless construction. Paperless. Um, and BIM was just on the rise, building information modeling. And I got a phone call. Yeah, we got this thing called a BIM model, uh, but we have no drawings. And I have 150 people standing out in sight, can't do any work. Get over here, you know? So I'm like, okay, land out on site. Uh, straight away, I hire some drafts people, uh, three drafts people, but it was taking me and three other drafts people like three days to keep this, to produce enough drawings to keep the site going for one day. So it wasn't sustainable. Um, so I said, look, I've been working on this idea. Let's give it a go. And literally overnight, um, I was able to convert the model into line, uh, a line based model issued to all the instruments out on site. And, you know, very quickly they were like three X faster in the field of building. Um, only problem was it was limited to like below ground services. Why is that? Um, so it's just plain line drawings and putting in pipes in the in the dirt. Right? Is that not? Is that the okay? So it had a massive advantage. Uh, what you're talking about, like uh, on a brownfield where you're going into a, and no one has the as built or where everything's out in the ground. You guys are Correct. okay. Got you. Yeah. So I was like, how can I level this up? Yeah. And augmented reality, I saw creeping in these thing called waveguides, and I was like, fuck. You know, if I could only take this 3D model, position it super accurately. You could just build from the model. You wouldn't yeah. need drones. And how much faster would that be? Uh, so like we did an early prototype and it was actually like we built a bathroom with it and it was like 17 times faster to build a bathroom. For real? Yeah. It was 17 times faster to build it because they were using that that tool? Correct. That's fantastic. Was it, was it doing anything? So it packed its schedule by moving it to the left. Did it reduce any cost? 
Massively. Okay. Yeah. So like that was like a founding thing, right? That was on accident. But now, you know, seven years later, we actually have it on real live massive data center projects. And we have MEP contractors install into holograms. And before utilizing our technology, they were like, you know, installing at a rate like 50 units per day. Um and w with our technology, with five people, and with our technology, they're now, in, or, or sorry, they were installing 10 units per day, but now with our technology, they're installing 50 units per day with half the labor. So that's the opportunity for production increase in the field, uh, just by leveraging holograms. And with, so what was the genesis behind XYZ? You, you were probably working for a different company when you were discovering these means and methods or these technologies and tools yes. that you could use. And then one day you just woke up and said, hey man, I can probably go adopt more technology or create better processes. So I'll, I'll, it was yeah. on the back of that project where I said like they got 3X performance increase. Um, that company, Jay Coffee, I went to the MD and I was like, fuck Jim, man, you've seen the benefits here. Yeah. I got to go for this. And they're you know? like. Um, and, and Jim goes, um, talk to me about it. And I said, look, if you're able to position this hologram out in sight, he's an old school guy, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you're able to position it accurately. You can just build directly from the hologram. And you know, how much better could that be? And he goes, oh yeah. And you could just mark it with a pencil. And I was like, Jim, you wouldn't even need a pencil. And he was just like, Boo, you know. So walk us through, like, what would that look like? What's the technology look like? Yeah. Uh, obviously, you had to go in there and do some sort of, there's scanning of documents. There's, I don't know. I mean, how do you get that type of technology in the hands of others? And is it something that's proprietary to you all? Correct. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. love this. Let's keep talking. So we built it from the ground up. Okay. Um, it's literally. Is it layered on top of another, like a, if an Oculus or, you know, some other headset? Yep. Okay. You have to have yours. Complete custom build. Okay. We, like there was other, um, AR device in the field, but the main ingredient that they lacked was actually the accuracy component. Okay. Um, and I was like, right, without the accuracy, really it's just a design tool, yeah. right? Um, and a lot of these AR devices, you load up a model. First of all, I wouldn't be able to load up the scale of models needed for a data center, right? Might load up a kitchen sink or whatever, or a room. Um, and what are kind of, where is the models that you're loading up? They're not CAD models. What are the models that are being fed into it? Is it CAD? So we extract it from CAD. Okay. Directly. Like DWG straight up. Yeah. Gotcha. Or, or Revit. Okay. Um, Revit. And uh, Navis works in any other 3d format, okay. uh, publish that to the cloud. And then that downloads onto the device. Okay. Uh, once it's on the device, then you go out on site, you tap into the site coordinate system and then boom, there's a hologram off the building in front of you. No shit. Yeah. And it's super precise. So, uh, what scale can you use that technology in? Is it, is it better served on tenant fit outs on the inside of an existing brownfield? Is it better for greenfields? Is it better for large scale volumes or smaller yeah. programs? What, what's the sweet spot? So right now we're just focused on data centers. Okay. It's about 95% of our <clears throat> revenue. Okay. Um, and we're all over the world. We're on about 1.3 gigawatts of data centers right now, globally. Okay. When did uh, you guys start? 2017. Just perfect time, a couple of yeah. years before COVID, when when everyone was adopting emerging technology because of COVID, right? Because of so, COVID, yeah. So that just put gas in the fire of our industry. Yeah, were you were you operating only? Did you start your business in London? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So is that where you primarily were operating out of at first when you first started? I guess correct. Yeah, we're we're in London, mainly the European market. Okay. You know, um, do you just spend any time in the U.S. with your product? Not at that time. Um, Are you doing work in Europe with U.S. based clients? Correct. That's where we started. And then they brought us over here. That's what I was expecting to see. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're doing shit over here now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. It's cool. So we just broke into this market this year. Um, we're a couple of projects down by Dallas, um, Nebraska, a couple of places across Florida. Um, and, and it's growing. So yeah, keep bringing us over here. <laughs> well, listen, I think it's just like any other piece of technology. Everybody loves great technology, but no one, it's like a, a swimming pool. You'll see everyone come to the edge of the pool and no one's sure how deep it is. No one's sure how cold it is. You know, someone's just waiting for someone to jump in. It's a hard mentality. Yeah. Once they do, then the rest kind of follow. We, no one wants to be the first one through the wall because it's technically the bloodiest, you know? 100%. So trying to find something that has been uh, validated by someone we trust is yes. important. So it's, you win as much work as you can, but I've learned that I sometimes have to make sure I win, win the right work sometimes because 
you could pick the right client and and they influence so many others that people just follow right so 100%. but i'll tell you i mean picking being able to start in the european market and introduce something that i think we all tend to expect something a little be a little bit more high speed low drag coming from europe you guys tend to adopt emerging technologies in a technical application like construction yeah. faster than we will we we hit procore and we're like we nailed it you know what i'm saying which we both know is great product but it's yes. not intuitive to figure out all the things we're trying to do yes and, and going to a a headset vr ar model of construction where you're measuring essentially twice before you're cutting once is going to be a new standard for means and methods do you agree 100 percent. um but it's it's getting adopted a lot quicker uh, than expected because it's 3d right and we operate in a 3d environment so you're kind of get rid of the 2d element static yeah. dumb data and you're now plugging into this rich, immersive environment, right? So you can plug directly into the 3D model, bring that to site, leverage that to install from, but also we're, we're leveraging, you know, from the capture perspective as well, it's unparalleled, right? You have all this information now positioned accurately. We can do progress capture, uh, you know, project controls, everything off the back of this, yeah. right? So we're moving towards like giving the workforce full autonomy in the field, and automating the capture of that data back to the office. So, you know, the main stakeholders on the project can make informed decisions. So I love the product because I love, I've seen things similar to this. We tried to do things similar to this uh, with other GCs in the US, but we were using, you know, like a Microsoft product. And then we were trying to use a BIM model or Revit model. Yes. And, and like you said, it's good for looking for clash coordination studies, but it's not good for accuracy. It, at least maybe it is, maybe it is now, but not to a level of confidence that I had to where I could be like, just use this as a tool. 100%. I want to talk about how effective the tool is and how widely used it is. Yes. And I'll, I'll explain it through the optics and how I view it, right? You're, you're a founder, right? Yes. And I'm a founder too. We kind of get lost in our own shit sometimes. But what I have, and I'm not saying you are, I'm not suggesting that at all. <laughs> I'm saying for me, I don't take the time to view what I'm looking at through the eyes of others sometimes, yes. right? Because I'm so busy as a visionary should be trying to create a vision of my own. But as a, as a person who's only focuses on labor, like that's, I'm not trying to, I want to go build leaders and I want those leaders to build teams. Yes. And those teams could build anything, including your data center or someone else's. But I start with that. So the human element is what I focus on first. Yes. I'm looking at all these technologies and I lean in on X, Y, and Z a little bit because I'm trying to figure out if that tool doesn't only help you improve to be a better builder and give you an advantage to have an accuracy or have a higher quality control, quality uh, assurance. I want to know if it makes it... I'm looking for technologies that make it where that lower the barrier of entry into the industry from a labor perspective. You nailed it, man. That's you what I'm looking for. Nailed it. I, I mean, think that's like, what we're all looking for. It's a huge, like, so I kind of think of it, we can get to a stage with these headsets that you can take someone straight out of college, uni, you name it, put this headset on them, and now they have the equivalent experience of a 40 year. That's what better. I'm talking about. And that's what you're given. And that's, that's our objective, to enable that in the field. Like, you know this, it, like construction as a whole has a problem. We need to make it, you know, sexier, more attractive to come and work in this space, right? Because like when I was younger, apprenticeships were huge, but they seem to be like dwindling out. I think the latest figures, I don't know, in the States, I think it's like half a million jobs are open right now. Oh, so many jobs. I just did a whole speech where yeah. I had a slide on uh, obsolescence of college. Yeah. Not to attack university. I have two kids in university. My yeah. daughter's about to graduate high school and go to university. But I also know that it's not a solution for getting a job in this industry. It, yes. it's, you don't even need to go to university to get a job in this industry. Exactly. But I do know that you have to be creative and you have to have... The ability to learn education in the formal sense is not as important here but the ability to learn is incredibly important yes. do you agree yes Go and ahead. i think like i think there's no better industry than construction because you can come in on the ground floor sweeping exactly. floors that's it and you can work your way up to the ranks just like i did yeah right yes i went back and got a degree during the recession in Ireland, sounds like you got two like a psychopath you got an architectural degree everyone knows that those are crazy <laughs> yeah, people yeah no one gets those yeah, I went against the grain there, you know, but I'm back on the straight and narrow now. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> Recovering architect. Recovering I like architect. It. I can hang with that person. Um, but like you can literally get in the ground floor, stay within the industry, 
and you know everyone wants to see it is back in a winner you know back in the underdog like yeah. go for it you know um just even people who can't read or write you know in this industry but yet they can come in at that level and end up being a director of a company or start a new data center business or a new technology business sure. who knows right but i think it's the only one of the few industries out there where you can make it what you want right and people will give you that opportunity surely sure there's a lot of risk in these projects but if you can prove to someone that you're able to introduce a new way of doing things that de-risks the project or makes the project faster very quickly you get a leg up right i agree all right so listen i i i pulled you off your I started selfishly asking questions from a labor perspective because I too am trying to figure out how to always bring more value to my clients, right? So go back to what you're talking about, this technology that you have. How do you, when you hire people, you know, is it experienced PMs only get to use this technology? I mean, what's your program and, and, and how effective and at what level do you guys use it? And at what point do you go back to some of the old school means and methods to validate? Cause it's, there's no silver bullet for anything. There's nothing that we've have found yet from a technology basis that can replace entirely what we've done as a human without some of those crutches. Do you agree? Or are you saying that you can get the whole thing done? Like our whole concept internally, we say is one solution, one device, one platform. That's what, let's talk about it because that's going to take time. That's a great, that's a great message. And I think we'd all agree that that would be awesome. Help us gain confidence. This is like, tell us, and you don't have to prove yeah. anything to me. I'm like, this is your chance to help us understand why, not just what it does and how you use it, but why should we believe in that product as an industry? And why aren't we all using that product then? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Why aren't we all using XYZ for that? Okay. Um, so let's kind of start from what what's today, right? Yeah. So out in the field, I'm building something. And I, I, first of all, I need 2D drawings. I get the 2D drawings. Like I was an architect. Sometimes I misinterpreted my own drawings the day after I created them. You know, so 2D is not a natural. Is that because you're Irish or is that because you're not? Maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I don't need to go to Dublin here for DC, DCAC Dublin in two weeks from now and have Irish guys even like, hey man, is there a problem here? Because <laughs> I have no problems with those people. I tried to go, I went to Dublin one time and I met, uh, I forget what the name of the GC was and their PM took me out and he wanted to make a point one night. And he did. You guys win. Ireland <laughs> Ireland has their shit on lockdown. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to that event. That's going to be a great event, man. I'm, I keep hijacking you. This is the energy of this conference. It's yeah. just, I, I I have so much fun at this conference yeah, and I have so much fun meeting new people and getting to learn more about their product. But someone comes into the field, you guys started a project, you get the 2D drawings. Yeah. And I, let there. me ask you, does XYZ have licensed PEs on staff that do civil structural, MEP, all those things? So as well? we'll, we'll get into that in a second. So I'm just saying today as a normal person on a normal project, you get the 2D drawings, you go out on site, you're like, right, I need to position that on site, right? So then you have to get a total station, you know, lock into the site coordinate system. You might need an engineer to help you position them drones accurately, or you grid line off a tape or whatever it is. But that process is in itself is so clunky and can take a lot of time, right? Uh, then you have to interpret that information, look for the tech subs, what, like, what is the specification of what I'm installing? All that is time, right? And takes knowledge. And, and you know, you, you need to know about that subject, right? So if you can replace all of that now with a model that appears in front of you that represents it in 3D, exactly how it's supposed to be in its end state, it's kind of like, it's a, it's a no brainer. It's like, you know how to install directly to that hologram and you can, it's like kind of becomes like Lego a little bit, right? You're just installing blockware to the line level. You can see the, the hologram there in front of you, you know, many courses of blocks, how much mortar is required, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all because that information is presented in front of you. Um, same with the MEP contractors right now, they're installing MEP works at high level. They don't need to. Uh, mark out where each individual struck goes. They see where it is, they see where it needs to go, and now they just install it directly um, to align with the hologram. And that's the kind of advantage of using a system such as this in the field. Why, uh, why did you build this product? Out of frustration. Um, you know, I was, I was in the field myself and I saw a lot of problems, a lot of issues. I was like, you know, I, you have to rely on different people to conduct your own task, right? Um, again, you need that, you need 
different tools just to do a simple task, measurement tools, specialist tools. I'm like, okay, if you could just if if you could just put all of this in a headset with all the information uploaded in front of you, you could just get on with your work and 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 get to it. And really that with this technology, you could literally go out on a site now, we're getting to a stage where it shows you the wayfinder path to your next task, right? Task complete. Move on to the next task, follow the wayfinder path and and then conduct that task you know you can introduce that level of uh, autonomy with a headset such as this um what's key though as well is whilst that headset is out in the field you're now able to capture all the information in real time so we're the most accurate data capture solution out there as well we're the only solution out there where you can capture exactly when something started when something finished how many people it took to conduct that task and how much it cost does it have the ability to predict accuracy on how far, how close you are to schedule? Like, uh, I mean, I'm sure there's other variables for that, but if you were doing something, can you show up and you're working on something? This is, by the way, you should have been through this many of them by now, but you're not. So you're, you know, you're three days behind schedule. If you want to catch up, you need to work this many shifts. Or, does it do any of that predictive analysis? Yeah. yeah. So really? that's the data capture side of the platform. So that's our main cell right now is like, we have someone out there all day, every day, capturing all this data in the highest level of fidelity. Are they wearing, are they capturing that data by simply walking around the site with, with the headset? headset on? Okay. Yeah. I got you. And it's like plan versus actual reporting that data up. And because it's so accurate in the capture side of things, you can leverage that data to see, predict whether you're on schedule or not. Uh, in fact, you can, you know, you can tell how good the performance is across the project on from all the trades as well. Uh, leverage that data to kind of tell you, draw a line, exact line in the sand where you are on program. So you're not kind of looking over your shoulder like traditionally going, oh, I think we're on, on, on time. Because if I traditionally you go out with a set of drawings and a highlighter and you're like, oh, about 10%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Trying to figure it out. Yeah. But your 10%, my 10% yeah, are different subjective. based on your yeah. experience. So this is like an objective form of capture. What else do you want to tell me about this product? Because I keep interrupting you. Um, well, I think where we are now is that we've built this headset. We have subcontractors out in the field installing from holograms. We're, you know, accelerating production there. How does it work? So does every subcontractor have to wear one? Eventually, that's where I'd like to get to. So what are you at today? Who Your construction manager, project managers are wearing them. And then the subcontractor PMs are wearing them too? So today, like the 95% of our revenue is we are employed either as a managed service okay. where we wear the headsets, go out, you show you, like we broke it into two stages, phase one. We take the headsets out on site. We capture all that information. It's all data capture. We feed all that information back to the platform. So you know what good looks like. And it's your data. You get to keep it or is the owner? It's, their, it's the owner's data. Okay. Um, and we sell directly to the clients themselves. Clients can then use that data to know exactly where they are on program. Um, once we go in about six or it's six month journey with them, we then move to phase two where we get the GCs to adopt this directly. And they use the headsets to capture the data rather than us. And then it's hands off X, Y, Z. And everyone uses this project tool to deliver the, the project. And we've seen like some of we've mutual clients, we won't discuss names, but you know, in the 20 years of their existence, they're now delivering these projects for the first time on time. And then the second project we did with them actually they delivered it six weeks early because of this data being captured. So the year, uh, so XYZ, what all is XYZ? Because I was under the impression you guys were a general contractor at first. And then you're telling me, well, we kind of do those things, but we use these tools. Now you're telling me like it's a managed service. It's a, as a service. We have these tools when they need it. They dispatch someone that from your team that has the experience using it. Yes. And they go out there and they use their experience and the technology and they become an advocate for yours. And then later on, they'll introduce it to the GC and then all the subs. Correct. Okay. It'll never be a product that you sell to another GC to use or another product that you That's sell. That's absolutely our objective. It is. Yeah. So <coughs> this is just our go-to-market motion is like, show everyone what good looks like. You know, it's new technology. Projects are, you know, risky enough as it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been on these projects. You can introduce more risk by a new technology that will ultimately <coughs> end up on the shelf if they're not confident with the outcome. 
So by us going in there and delivering a managed service first, it kind of shows them, you know, it's the quickest time to value, show them that, look, this is a new way of doing things. And if you follow this, you'll smash your targets <coughs> and win them over Yeah, through delivery. Then you hand over the headset to their supply chain and let them utilize that to help them deliver the project. And it's working quite effectively for us. How long does it take to team to train one of your new new hires on that? And what's the minimum? Of, like, what what is the type of profile for someone that you hire who's a qualified enough candidate to begin introducing that technology? So we just hire like the land surveyors. We call them in Europe uh, or engineering background, civil engineering, construction managers. We just hire them directly. Um, they need to have either an engineering or construction type of background in some capacity. Correct. Okay. Correct. Do um, they have to have built data centers before? No, not, <clears throat> not okay. at all. Yeah, because, you know, ultimately they're going out and they see the hologram presented in front of them. Yeah, they see what it looks like. And they see what it looks like. So they, all the information is presented in front of them and then it's literally like spot the difference, what's there, what's not there. I think next year DCAC, what I would ask you to do between now and then is, <clears throat> um, so there's a general contractor here in the U.S. that did it, and they used to host the VIP uh, for the speakers backstage where they had a hologram. And it was really more just a – they put on an Oculus, and you'd walk through a construction site that they built, you know what I'm saying? So you could see what they've done from there. What would be cool is <clears throat> if you can collect some stuff to where you can put a VR headset on people here – so they could kind of walk through and see some of the things that those people see through those things. Like we had a, we have a AR set down there yep. right now from Ineo Yambacher, right? Yes. <clears throat> and it was, you know, obviously Maki on how to, yes. uh, it was cool. It was very cool. But I think we're getting to that point where next year, maybe there's something that you have where people can put, do you already have that? Is that what your yeah, team has down there right now? Say. I saw a headset going on someone downstairs when I was walking back here. So yes. What yeah, is so your team putting on people? down there. Uh, we're kind of doing it between talks right now, but yeah. just a headset down there, try it on and give it a go. And what those people are able to see is examples of what you've used it for in the past. So the they'd 3D see a, a mock data center uh, through the Actual. lens. Yeah. Um, but because it's not positioned or represent what's here, it's kind of floating in space. To, <laughs> where you really see it is out in the field. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I imagine. Yeah. So what do you have? Uh, what do you have that you could show? What are you showing downstairs right now? So we literally have the, the headset down there, you can put it on, you can load up a 3D model, you can interact with the 3D model, you can uh, play around with a hologram, essentially. You know, I want people to check look. it out. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, but again, it's a completely different experience when it's positioned out in the construction side, it makes a lot more sense. But in terms of today, it gives you a flavor of what the level of detail we're able to capture. I love it. Where's the technology going? So we're going for a smaller, lighter, faster, you know, that's- no, I mean, like it, you started it seven years ago, right? Yeah. Approximately. And now you're getting to this point where you keep iterating, like even the iPhone, I'm on the iPhone, whatever, 15. Yes. <clears throat> uh, where's that technology of which you created, you know, this VR reality of accuracy? Yes. Where does it, where does it end? Like, what do you keep diving into with what you're doing? So from the hardware perspective, we're trying to, you know, better battery life, better performance. You know, I want to get to some more builders' heads. You know, at the end of the day, a builder finishes, uh, a trade finishes out in sight, they go into the dry room, they take it off, and flick it across. Oh, yeah, 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 you know, damage so those things. Robustness we're working on, you yeah. know, make it more robustness. But we want this to be available like in any low shop, for instance, eventually, okay. you know. And we want everyone on the project to actually wear these headsets. And then the headsets will be capturing everything in real time and adding to production, you got this unified <laughs> kind of autonomous workforce, right? I like it. So the evolution is really in the adoption rate of it, not just the capabilities of the technology itself. Correct. So how do we increase the adoption rate? What 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 are the barriers for that? Is it the function of economics? Like it's just simply, it's not, uh, it's an affordable luxury, but doesn't pencil, or is it something that um, people are just too scared of it? You know, because the herd mentality, you're like, I haven't seen enough people use it. And when I see that become a standard, it's like, I can imagine like Procore, right? Yes. It was an emerging technology. Everyone's like, dude, we have the greatest sh shit. How come you don't use it? And, and yes. I would argue that they are one of the finest products out there. I don't really know if I like how they charge for it, right? But I think the rest of the industry has fallen into that too, where I yes. think that you'll see people walking away from that product over the course of time. But the mentality was 
how do you convince people you have the best product to get them to adopt it <clears throat> when there's risks associated to it without a return? And then once you get it, then you could really, I mean, now it became the standard, you know, Procore became a standard for everyone yes. that had to use at some point. So I do think, how do you change and what do you have to do to sway the adoption rate of this technology? So our, our go to market right now is very much saturate this vertical, right? Yeah. So you have referenceable customers. It's happening right now. Everyone knows about XYZ on the, on the ground from the client's perspective. Why is it XYZ, by the way? Because uh, that's a Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, so your XYZ position in space. Okay. So we say XYZ reality. Interesting. Yeah. Now, what was the genesis behind this? You, you were just frustrated with what you're doing, but how long did it take you from the time you were doing your day job till you were tweaking with this on the side? It was it was a tough journey, yeah. So it was like you were juggling two jobs. Yeah, I bet. Um, working on prototypes. Got to a stage where I needed capital. It's hardware to raise. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> back to earlier, I turned to J Coffee Construction. I said, you've seen the benefits. I've seen it. Let's do this. And they actually seeded the business. They did. Yeah. No kidding. Are they um, still involved? Uh, yeah, well, they're still on our, they're still a shareholder. Um, so they got us going. Of course, we didn't raise enough. We went back for more. Sure. So they got us to a point where we had a, a prototype that we could go to an institutional to investor yeah. and raise real money. I got you. So what, what has been, you know, some of the best lessons that you've learned in trying to pursue this process? Because the industry's evolved a lot since, you know, when you started this product in seven years ago. I mean, yeah. the way that we build data centers isn't even close to the same. In fact, not only is there a third iteration to the types of data centers that we're building, I would say there's three different types of AI data centers themselves. I mean, yeah. there's not just one homogenous design around cloud either, right? So you have, you know, different types of data centers, but we're building more cloud and now hyperscale than anything. When you were doing this seven years ago, it was still worldwide web, internet of things, data centers for the enterprise end users and some colo operators, right? And some cloud sort of emerging, but now it's a completely different game. How do you, how do you see that scaling with your product? I, I see our solution is the key to scaling. Okay. I really think like we need to change how we're doing things, right? We can't just keep adding more cooks to the kitchen. We need to change the recipe, right? Yeah. Um, another contractor has gone bust in the UK. Like, <coughs> just last week, right? It's scary to talk about. You want to brush it under the carpet, but like we need to change the way we're delivering uh, on these data centers, right? You see the off-site manufacturing piece coming into play. There's a shortage of labor. My objective <coughs> is to be able to deliver these buildings faster at scale and at a reduced cost. And I think by deploying XYZ's tech, that's the main re way to do means and ways to do so. Um, just by having a clear line in the sand of where you are in progress, leveraging that, there's a whole AI piece we haven't talked about today, yeah. you know, um, but having the cleanest <clears throat> form of data capture makes sure that your predictions on the future are, are as close to real as possible, right? Because it's based on empirical data. Um, so that's super important. What Back are some of the challenges that you see? What, what are the questions that you get or the pushback you get from prospective customers? <clears throat> Misperception of something, you know, what is it? Or, hey, that's not the way we've used to do it. Or the adoption of emerging technology takes time sometimes. A hundred percent. I mean, the first time going into a room and I mentioned AOR, you know, Back in 2017, 2018, they're like, what the fuck is that? You yeah. know? So you had to describe, like, did you ever watch Star Wars? Remember holograms and Star Wars? Now I think the market is more educated on what AOR is. <clears throat> when, when you explain how it, it can be used as an engineering tool, you know, now they're listening, right? And they see this, this helmet in front of them and what it's capable of. Then it's like, okay, you're a hardware platform. We're like, no, we're, we're a platform. Right, we're not just hardware. We leverage that data coming from the hardware to give you all this data on your yeah. on your project. And when they see the level of detail we're able to capture in real time, it's literally a mirror world reflection of the activities going out on site. It blows their mind. What does it replace this technology? Is it just a function of quality, or does it replace a part of the process for someone else? Does it remove a project engineer from a program? It's, it's Really, is is it, at this stage, it's not about replacing anyone. It's about doing more with less. So when you're doing more with less, it, that's not less money, though, sometimes. So, I mean, some people are going to run these projects based on a finite or a fixed budget. Yes. It, 
sometimes, you know, it giveth with one hand and taketh with the other. I'm giving you a better piece of technology. It's going to cost some money, perhaps. How do people make it pencil out, or is it is it just a not a layer on top of what they're already doing? But does it? How does it pay for itself in terms of the value that it creates? So <clears throat> we can come in and say, look, our main objective here is for you to deliver your data center on time. Yeah. How much is that worth to you? You know, that's worth everything yeah. to people right now. The second thing is, even if we just want to go in on a, a pure, you know, cost neutral perspective, just by having the headset in the field, you reduce the rework activities on that project by about 30%, right? And the cost reduction is about between 7 and 11% on average, right? So we can get the rework down to less than 1%. Just by having this out in real time, out on site, you can say, don't put that there because if you put that there, it's gonna clash with future works. And just by eliminating them mistakes that are built into the process, that can have a massive cost, just coming in cost neutral from that perspective alone. Interesting. Well, listen, what else do you want us to know about your product? It seems like a pretty exciting piece. And <clears throat> I don't want it to be the best kept secret. In fact, one of the things we pride ourselves with on both the conference and this podcast is, is giving a platform to the emerging technologies that have the ability to be not only disruptive to industry, but advance the industry. It sounds like this is one of those types of products, right? 100%. I mean, that's our whole goal, our purpose. You know, people are like, oh, you can go into shipping, you can go into other industries. That's not our purpose. I'm the same. Look, I I get asked to bid on things everywhere yeah. where labor is required. And knowing that my purpose is to help as many veterans as I can, <clears throat> I believe that the best way I could help them today is, I think if you're going in two, three, four different directions at once, you end up kind of going nowhere. And really what I want to do is, I think to be great at something, you got to be willing to suck at a lot of other shit. And I want to be great at the data center side first. Yes. <clears throat> Just because I think it grows faster than every other industry because of every other, every other industry. So I'm really focused on this space and I'm trying to figure out how I can adopt new tools, new technologies on my team. Yes. Right? We're a tech incubator for labor. Yes. <clears throat> but our clients are, half my clients are the same operators that you see, the other half are their enterprise end users. Yes. And those people are asking me how I can bring in more value. And if I could put a piece of technology in the hands of someone who, <clears throat> That technology may now make it easier for them to get hired in this industry yes. because their quote unquote experience is less relevant. Just their technical aptitude is necessary. Thus, you needed engineers or construction people, people that feel confident understanding the language and the lexicon of the space. Yes. But if I could find those people, and there's people coming out of the military that have that skill set, they just didn't build data centers for the last five years. I could give them a piece of this technology. Yes. As long as it's intuitive enough, I can introduce new labor to this industry faster than those that are going to be retiring. Yes. In this industry. hundred percent. Right? We should totally <clears throat> talk about that because like we have a shortage of labor. We have a shortage. We need technology. We have a shortage of skilled labor. If we can combine like, you know, technology with the new labor coming in and get them ramped up as quickly as possible and get them going, all the better. And that's exactly what we're open to achieve. That's all I do. Tech and get better for labor. So I have my team right now. I think <clears throat> there was another, um, there's a few different AI. I mean, <clears throat> it's not just the AR and VR companies that we're talking to today. It's now we know what they're capable of doing. And you kind of put a pin in this and, and, and I assume we'd come back to it. Not now, but another time. But what's AI doing not to create more demand for us to have a larger volume or velocity of services to provide? What's AI doing to make your tool better? Yeah. <clears throat> so we're leveraging AI. So first of all, what was important is the cleanest form of data capture. Otherwise, you get shit in, shit out. Shit in is bad, yeah. I mean, that's why people, I think, worry is if the drawings that you're using and the Revit models that you're using are shit, then so is everything else. Because almost no project I've ever seen that I went to construction drawing sets on and went to go build on. Yes. Uh, they never looked like they did on the as build side. So you're building to something, but there's deviations that take place. It could be something as simple as the transformers or the switch gear came in. Yes. It was fed on the wrong side or the other. You, you've seen it. I've seen it all, right? hundred percent. So there's a, a million things you got to do. <clears throat> it just seems like you got to be really agile and really intuitive with that product to understand that, yes, it's accurate. As accurate as what you fed it and what you're feeding it is not right from day one yeah. because Revit models are hundred percent until the project is done building. Same with the CAD drawings, right? We see it's a, it's like a forcing function, right? Because now we're given BIM purpose for everyone else. Yes, that's it's fair. It's no longer like 
just a, a BIM team in the corner, you're leveraging that model now in the field to inform the main thing with construction, which is production, right? Yeah. And you're utilizing that out in the field. So that we've seen GCs increase their standard, you know, <coughs> where the level of fidelity goes from LOD 300 to LOD 450 or whatever it may sure. be. We've seen schedules improve in terms of rather than just coming in at level three, level four, you get level five, right? So they keep adding detail uh, to the inputs into the XYZ platform. And then leveraging that then in the field, you're getting this granular data, which not only informs that project, but informs all future projects as well, right? Because you're now building this performance base <coughs> of, you know, what a how a particular contractor or person uh, performs in this region, right? And you can leverage that for future projects. Uh, maybe it's another building on the campus or whatever it may be, but you can leverage that data to do a, a, an analysis of how long it would take in the future to build on that same site. Very cool. So how do people learn more about your technology and so how do we help get this out there? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> check out our website. It's a good start. XYZ.com? XYZReality.com. XYZReality.com, okay. Uh, let's get you hooked up. Maybe we can do a, a, I will. a clip done with this, the I'll come down on. There. I'd love to do that. Post um, that. But yeah, just invite us to engage with your teams and your projects. Uh, we're talking with, we're, right now we're focused on the clients themselves. The um, enterprise end users? Or, correct. Okay. Are, are the clients the operators and the end users or what? Colos and the hyperscalers. Okay. That's what I'm figuring. Yeah. And we go directly to them. Um, and, you know, the other 5% is people just pulling us into other verticals, right? You yeah. kind of, we're, we're doing some really cool stuff. Uh, <coughs> on it's actually probably healthy else. that you do that. Um, just so you could introduce the... Every industry has a different method of approach to what they do. Yes. And and we get so uh insulated within this construct that we've created in a niche environment like this industry yes. that we kind of sometimes just pass ideas back and forth in a limited fashion within what we believe are the limitations or the capabilities of the industry. Again, that construct. But if we can go out and beta test new strategies and other verticals that are adjacent to ours, uh, but are in parallel to ours, then we could introduce those methods as well. I mean, if you think about what you were talking about today, it's probably no different than what a manufacturing plant is trying to do that creates automobiles. The only difference is they're using robotics and, and control systems, and we're still human using human beings, but they're talking about the same things. Yes. How to get more efficient, reduce costs, reduce risk, yes. improve quality. I think the extra complexity <clears throat> though in a live project is, you know, it's a, it's, it's a dynamic changing environment. Factory is kind of stationary. You can control a lot of variables. On a live project, it's a lot, lot different, right? Yeah. Um, so look, we're, you can uh, reach out to us on our website, engage with our team. You'll probably see us on your pro on our project near you. Yeah, yeah. Like, but uh, uh, we're excited. But you guys are everywhere right now. I've, I've been, uh, I think, I think I, you guys came up on my radar like a year, year and a half ago. And then I started, uh, you have good account managers or, you know, they're, they're doing their job. They're sending notes to our team trying to they're get relentless. the game. Yeah. And that's what you need in this space. It's uh they got to fight for airtime yeah. and uh, it, it's an omnipresence. You got to maintain one. If not, then they're listening to someone else. And, and technology iterates and evolves so much faster than biology, human tenants of biology, that we have to focus on people and trying to figure out how they can change the way they approach emerging technologies so that we can leverage those emerging technologies. And right now there's fear is still the biggest limitation for growth. It's not the technology. Yeah. Technologies are fantastic, but some people are just too scared to do things. Does that make and sense? That's, that's why we went the managed service route first is like, that's been incredibly effective for us in building confidence in this technology with our early customers. Yeah. And then they get the confidence, they see the results, like fuck, let's get this on all our projects, right? I love so it. then they're like, "Can you educate our supply chain?" And you're like, "Yeah, sure, let's do it." And then it's kind of like you know yourself, saturate the market. Now you have a referenceable customer. You can say, "Well, look, we can start from scratch, but I'm already doing it over here on twenty projects. Let's have the same conversation over here, and you can build scale from there." And what we're hoping and what we're seeing is happening is the supply chain then is actually siphoning that into neighboring verticals, you know, like infrastructure and uh, nuclear, pharma, airports. Um, th they're, they're bringing it over and they're kind of like, hey, look, these are the benefits we're getting over here. And they're winning work with it too, right? So 
it's kind of that that level of network effects is super important. Uh, so the more we can talk about this, Kirk, the better. I love it. And this is the first time we've talked about it. But I can tell you right now, it's not going to be the last, right? So, yeah. and I hope that to have you, I mean, I hope that you guys come back. First of all, thank you for supporting the conference, not just in your attendance, but you're a sponsor. Yeah. And uh, we wouldn't be able to host this conference without the support of groups like you. And we're really proud and honored to have groups that are emerging in disruptive in technology and, and changing the way that we evolve this industry. Those are the sponsors that we want for this type of show anyway. So I hope that what we can do is <clears throat> let this be the beginning of a cool new relationship. And then over the course of time, like as we are evolving together as an industry, Next time you're in America, you pop in here, you come hang out with me. We do a podcast in the studio and we catch up. You know, we unpackage a little bit more until these are complicated topics. These are complicated subjects because this is complicated technologies. So it's going to take time for people to wrap their mind around these things. Yeah, I think so. But it's, all, it's all about delivery, right? And people at the end of the day, like, you know, so shout out to you as well. I love what you're doing for the industry. I uh, appreciate that. Like I, coming from the industry, I think we need more people like you as well, right? Uh, well, listen, it's an honor to meet you. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. And uh, thanks for joining the Data Center Revolution. But thank you for joining DCAC Live. I, let's go back out there. I want to play with your with your widget. And then let's go hear some of more of the speakers. Time for points? <laughs> yeah, we definitely do. <laughs> this, is the, like, this is all I'm about now, actually. Like, it's so funny. I, I don't really drink that much anymore just because... <clears throat> I had to break that perception of what I used to, I used yeah. to go to these conferences and just take them over, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And hijack them and have fun. Not that I'm not that man anymore, but like I have to start taking this shit serious because I have too many souls that depend on me to do my job right. But I was the same, you know, it needs to be sustainable, right? And I got a little baby girl now, six months old. There you go. Eight, Congratulations. Three. Yeah. But now's the time, like this is, I told everybody, I'm like, I don't give a shit what's happening around DCAC. There's no stopping. I'm going to have a few pints. So, and I'm going to do the same in Dublin. And I'll tell you this, last time I went to Dublin, I had to get on that plane of shame because I went out and I was like, I can hang with you boys all night. And I remember at four o'clock, they put me in a ride car that took me to my hotel to get my bags to take me straight to the airport so I could clear customs on the Dublin side. And I poured onto an airplane and didn't wake up until I was how, back in America. How, how long was that? That was just one night? It was like, I was only there for two or three days in Dublin. Yeah, but uh, <clears throat> it's kind of like, I looked at Dublin almost like I look at Vegas. Like people like me don't belong there. Cause it's a great town. It I is used, a great like, town. Like coming from the West of Ireland, I used to hate Dublin, right? For real. It's just kind of like, it's the big city. Oh and I'm God. from the country. But, yeah, that's true. I can see that. But like Such over time, town. like it's just like great town, great drinking town. There are bars older than America, left, right, and center in Dublin. You got to go to that. I mean, that's yeah. heritage. It's, it's incredible to see, you know, how far our country has come because of the migration that came from those types of markets. So listen again, Great podcast, great time with you. I look forward to doing this more often. I look That's forward good. to seeing your product in the field with us too, okay? Perfect. Thanks, Cheers, man. Cheers, mate. Appreciate it. Thank you.